ladies and gentlemen, it is Tuesday once again. THC Podcast, the hot tag is back. This week, we got Low Life Louis Ramos on the show. Greatly appreciate you showing up, man. I, I appreciate this. Re- really excited to talk to you. I appreciate you guys having me, man. It means a lot to be on here. Thanks. Yeah, most definitely, man. Definitely appreciate it. Definitely. Uh, King of Hardcore of the Northeast, man. I think I think that's the title. Sunset Park. Yeah, they, they started calling me the Hardcore King of New York because uh, back in about 2002, 2003, after I had left Jersey All Pro, I popped up at a Frank Goodman's UXW, and Frank Goodman was very good to me. He was a promoter for USA Pro UXW, promoted for many years in the New York area. He took great care of me. Uh, he let me. Uh, he gave me some big names to wrestle. He put me in the ring with Balls Mahoney. He put me in the ring with Axel Rotten, and New Jack, Abdullah the Butcher, so on and so forth. And you know those opportunities are hard to come by. And uh, he took great care of me. And the fans started calling me that out of the blue. And I appreciate every single fan that uh, you know went out of their way to call me that. It, to me, it was an honor. Yeah, absolutely, man. Abdul the Butcher, man. That was uh, honestly probably my favorite heel growing up. And uh, seeing you wrestle him, man, that, that that must have been really exciting. How was it working with him? Let me tell you something. The first time, the first time I worked with Abdul the Butcher, it was thanks to Homicide. Uh, we were part of his uh, quote unquote crew at Ring of Honor. Uh, we did a run out, and Abdul the Butcher attacked us. That was at the uh, what the what Ring of Honor would probably call uh, their final battle. Nowadays, it was Night of the Butcher back in their first year in existence on uh, December 7th, 2002. And uh, I got to work with Abby then. Uh, Jack Sabbath from ICW brought me in to wrestle Abdul at the famous Elks Lodge in New York. And another great opportunity. And then Frank Goodman, which is to me the, the, my favorite, one of my favorite wrestling stories of all time. Frank Goodman brought in Abdul the Butcher to wrestle the Sandman. Yeah, Sandman was locked up at the time and could not make the show. <laughs> Abdullah, I you know, I had walked up to him out of respect, you know, you shake everybody's hand in the locker room like you taught when you're coming up. I said, It's a pleasure to meet there's a pleasure to see you again, sir. I never thought he would remember me because he's worked so many people. He says, Hey champ, how are you? Who are you working today? I go, Look, I'm doing a match with a couple of like local guys that Goodman wanted me to squash. And uh, Abby actually got his guy, John Cheatham, that works with him to go get Frank Goodman. And Abdullah the Butcher himself asked Frank Goodman for me to work him. And that was like the ultimate honor to have a legend like Abdullah request me by name and wanted to work with me. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. One of the all-time greats. Um, Also, Homicide, you you often work with Homicide. I think he's honestly one of the most underrated guys in, in the business. And uh, I heard you were actually somewhat trained by him also, right? Homicide, um, what happened was a long time ago, and I love telling this story, me and a couple of guys uh, started going to a local wrestling gym ran by a guy named Pedro Martinez in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we used to do something called IWW Insane World Wrestling. We were basically just backyarders renting a ring, so we were basically backyarding, but we had a real wrestling ring. And Homicide and late on Tower of Torture and uh, Jay Lover were, and uh, Shaolin and a couple other guys, Manslaughter, a couple other guys, Eagle, were guys that were uh, training in that ring, and they were doing the professional shows in New York for this guy, Pedro, and uh, they were the guys that used to train his students. Uh, Homicide took us under his wing, the IWW guys, and helped us out tremendously. And But then after we left that place, Homicide took it upon himself to train Myself, Loki, Monster Mac, Mace, and Buffy, who became the Christopher Street Connection later on. They no longer wrestled, but they were a great tag team. And he trained all five of us, and, uh, you know, he helped us out. He co-signed for us. Uh, him and Leighton actually took us to go get our New York licenses, because in New York, back in the day, you needed a license to wrestle. And unless you were ready, you didn't just get in the ring to wrestle. You had to have a license. So he took all of us. He co-signed for us. He took care of us, and without Homicide, there wouldn't be any of us, and the uh, wrestling in New York wouldn't be as rich with talent and, and, and uh, what's the word I'm trying to look and, you know, respect if it wasn't for Homicide and what he brought to the table in New York wrestling. 
Right, absolutely. Boxer, awesome. you got a question? Um, well, you kind of already said how you got your start, so I wasn't going to go there. You worked for a bunch of places like Jersey All Pro, ROH, CD, CZW. What's some of the, like, which would you say was the best yeah, place to cool. work? I'll get into that. I'll, I like to shoot. This is what I like to talk about. Uh, first <laughs> place that I got a break in was, of course, the LIWF Doghouse. Thanks to Bobby Lombardi, mentor, father, friend, to everybody in New York wrestling scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, he gave me the opportunity to uh, to just, you know, help out in his gym and, you know, get creative with stuff. But at the same time, parallel to this, I was working as a referee for Fat Frank and Jersey Old Pro Wrestling. Fat Frank uh, had me doing a heel rep gimmick, which in turn led to me becoming a wrestler and doing some of his death matches, no real barbed wire matches, fire matches, whatever, cage, barbed wire cage match. And I got my start there. Uh, in December 17, 1999, I defeated Homicide for the JP Suicidal title. That was like the death match championship. Uh, about a few months after that, Jersey O Pro kind of uh, took some hits from the uh, the media and the uh, the government in the in the area of Bayonne, New Jersey. They wanted them out. They basically used me as a scapegoat. Uh, Jersey O Pro basically gave everybody else a chance and put them in the ring and gave them all different characters and stuff. And everybody got a chance to shine. And I was kind of like pushed to the side. They did give me a couple other opportunities after that, but nothing ever came to fruition. My time in, J- in J- Jersey Oak Pro is, is cherished by me. It was an honor to work for them, and they actually made me a member of the Hall of Fame. And Frank I. Davey, I'm shooting. Fat Frank, I love you, and thank you for that opportunity. Uh, working for, obviously, like I said, the Doghouse. I was there from its inception till its closing, and working for Bobby Lombardi, working alongside Homicide, learning so much from him, and watching a whole bunch of younger guys come up was unbelievable, so I had fun there. And then the other place that I'm really, you know, thankful for working, like the aforementioned USA Pro, working for Frank Goodman, always a privilege. He ran seven-hour shows, but from bell to bell, the shows might have taken six, seven hours, but there was just as many fans in the building at the beginning as there was at the end, and that's a testament to the quality of shows that he put on. He put on great shows and, you know, one or a few ticket seller matches, but that's the way he operated, and he gave everybody a shot. Whether you sold tickets or not, whether you were a big name or not, he tried to give everybody a shot, and that's commendable. Also, Jack Sabbath in ICW. I had I worked one time for CZW for John Zandig at the Extreme 8 in 2003. Uh, it just didn't work out between me and CZW. I think Zandig always had t- took to heart that I was a JP guy, and I used to take pot shots at CZW at the time. But that was just part of the business. That was just me trying to get heat. I don't have no heat. I have nothing but love for John Zandig and his style, and I was never fortunate enough to work for DJ Hyde, who now owns CZW. I did a couple of shots for Ring of Honor while they were owned by Gabe Sapolsky, and uh, Gabe gave me a, a good opportunity, but the only thing that I, I'll not give for is he always promised me to give me one singles match in Ring of Honor, and I always did like extra stuff, like I was a guy jumping out of the crowd, I was a guy attacking somebody, I was helping homicide, I was running into the, into the building, causing commotion, he, you know, he said my name. He interviewed me a couple of times, but he never gave me that one match, which I would have loved to have. But, again, I, I thank Gabe Sapolsky for the opportunity, a real good wrestling mind, and just uh, just a lot of other places, so many places that I worked for. I wrestled one time for PWS, which is probably one of the biggest indie feds in the, in the country right now. I worked for them once or twice when they were just owned by Eric Pleska. They're doing big things. I worked for JCW a handful of times recently, and a big shout out to UWA Elite. They have their comeback show this uh, Saturday night in South River, New Jersey. And me and uh, Steve Monster Mac teamed up for a year and a half at um, uh, UWA Elite, and we were the tag team champions for six months. And a bunch of young, hungry talent there. Number one guy to look at there is Kyle the Beast. Kyle the Beast, a phenomenal talent and a future star. Mark my words. Absolutely, man. I know. I know you mentioned uh, Eric Plesko. We're actually going to have him on, uh, I believe, next week. So, uh, big shout out to Pro Wrestling Syndicate. We're we're uh, big supporters of them. Yeah, I have nothing but good. I have nothing but good words and, and kind words for Eric Plesko. And you know, I worked for him in the past, and he's you know a stand up guy. Treated my family well when I went to a PWS show as a fan. I took my my, my family, and he was nothing but respectful and just just treated me like. Treated me very well. I can't. I can't stress that enough. Oh, 
Absolutely, and uh, I, I know I know you did an angle with uh, Anthony DeBlasi, aka Don Tony, from uh, from his podcast, where uh, he stapled a contract to you. Um, I just I just want to get <laughs> your thoughts. That, that, looked, that looked awfully painful. Yeah, I was right to my bare butt, but you know what? I had actually done that spot before. Danny DeMonto, who's a local uh, a local indie name here in the area, I've worked with Danny for many many years. I saw him as a child taking pictures at JAP. And Danny DeMonto is one of my dear friends in wrestling. Much love to him. Uh, he ran one show, like his own show. It was called EIW, and he ran it out of the old East Building in New Jersey. It was me and my buddy Danny Yams. We took on the L Street Kids in a staple gun match. And that was the, the first time that I ever had my pants pulled down and my ass stapled. And in this big match that we did with Don Tony, and the guy that I actually wrestled in the match is actually my cousin Peter. Um, we did, uh, I told him we're going to do the spot where you staple my butt because Peter was at the time very green. So he didn't really have a, a grasp of the, in the ring yet. So I had to basically carry him along, but he did a great job. And then the spot came off phenomenal. And I loved working with Anthony de Blasi. A lot of people have bad things to say about him. I don't have any negatives to say about Anthony de Blasi. He will always have my respect as a person that was in the business and as a friend. Absolutely. Box fun, you got a question? Um. Well, I get. I mean, you recently, last week, you made a um, an announcement on Shining Wizards podcast. Do you want to get into that at all, or? Yeah, sure, man. You know, like I said, guys. You know, when I come on on you know a podcast, an interview, a television show, whatever, I'm an open book. I'm awesome. like that in my regular life. My Facebook is not private. I am, you know, what you see is what you get. I try to be open, honest, cool cool guy with everybody. Um, basically, I did a few shows. I wrestled against Haku in an eight-man tag on December 5th. I wrestled a young up-and-coming star named Brandon Kirk, one half of the Rogues with Jeff Cannonball, two of my favorite young guys in the business. I wrestled uh, Brandon Kirk in a street fight match, same real street fight. And my MO in maybe the last year and a half of my career was getting stuff broken over my head. And when I mean stuff, I mean like household shit, like, excuse my language, things like VCRs, cable boxes, DVD players, microwaves, whatever. I took a really hard shot with a very old, very heavy VCR about two, three times, just just a lot of headshots throughout the match. A couple of weeks later, I started getting some headaches, which were normal. But then I said, you know what, let me go to the doctor, make sure it's not my heart, blood pressure, whatever. Everything turned out fine. Uh, all the other tests came out fine. They said, take a CT scan. And in the CT scan, the doctor showed me a lot of old damage, a lot of scar tissue, bruising of the brain, trauma, which is things you definitely don't want to hear when it comes to your brain. Mm -hmm. So in my best interest, you know, the doctor said, hey, look, you know, if you're doing professional wrestling, even the jarring of the bump, which, you know, you're taught chin to chest when you bump, even holding your chin to your chest and falling with all your weight, your brain is going to jar. Even if it never hits the back, even if the back of your head doesn't hit the ground, it's still going to jar. You're still going to have impact on the brain. So it, it, it's in my best interest to no longer take any type of damage to the head. So Absolutely. that being said, I'm, I'm a family man. I have two children, a beautiful wife at home that I must take care of for the rest of my life. So I decided to, you know, do the unselfish thing, step away as an in-ring performer because I'm not going to leave the wrestling business so I'm going to step away. I got some more tests coming up, and that will determine if I have an in-ring goodbye, meaning if I have maybe one or two matches that I can do maybe with somebody that I know and trust right. and, you know, have a couple of goodbye matches and do something big, a big send-off, whatever. Not because I want to, but a lot of people have asked me already. So once those tests come in, if they're positive, I will give it some thought, and I'll probably go ahead with doing one or two last matches mm -hmm. on, like, a singles and a tag with my brother Steve, or I'll just hang it up and not do that and trans translate that into doing, like, managing work. I'll be managing Steve Monster Mac on uh, April 17th for CTW in uh, Bridgewater, New Jersey, so I'm looking very much forward to that, and that might be the start of something else in my career. Awesome. Now you briefly mentioned uh, managing. Um, I, I've heard plenty of your promos, and I think you're actually an underrated promo guy. Um, what do you think about the guys on, on, on the indie circuit as far as promos? Because 
they kind of get the stereotype that a lot of guys can't do promos, and I think I think that's a false statement because, uh, you know, me, I, I, live in, of, I live in the Northeast. I'm sorry, go ahead. A lot of guys uh, have great promo skills. You know, it's funny, you're going to interview my favorite promo guy in the last 20 years. You're going to interview him right after. He's going to join you guys at 9 o'clock, and that's Bulldozer Matt Trima. He just gets it. His promos are ridiculously awesome. If you have a chance to check out his last promo that he did for the match that he had at On Point with Kyle the Beast, just a phenomenal promo, unbelievable. The promos that he did uh, at DJ Hyde during their feud, escalating to the cage of death a couple of years back, those promos are un- got unreal. Nothing more, I don't think there was a more realistic promo since Mick Foley in the ECW days in the mid-90s with the Kane Dewey promos and the anti-hardcore hero promos. Those were probably the greatest promos then, and the Matrimon promos are the greatest promos now. And guys like Eddie Kingston, guys like Steve Monster Mac, you know, these guys these guys cut great promos, man. You know, Kevin Matthews from PWS cuts a phenomenal promo, in my opinion. It, 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 there's so many guys, and, you know, they don't get the credit they deserve, but these guys are, are great promo guys all around. Absolutely, man. Um, favorite deathmatch wrestler that, that influenced your career? I know, I know you got a couple, man. Just uh, name, name a few that, that influenced you. There's a few, but I, I told this story once before, and it's it's the the truth. It's 100% shoot. I grew up a Hulkamaniac. I'm a Hulk Hogan fan. I'll be a Hulk Hogan fan until they put me in the ground. The man was the biggest influence in my wrestling career. As I got older, you watch other stuff. And me being of Hispanic heritage, I used to watch Puerto Rican wrestling with my mom and dad before my dad left. And uh, Abdullah the Butcher was a regular. And I started looking at Abdullah the Butcher and his style. And then I looked in the mirror, and I resembled Abdullah the Butcher more than I resembled Hulk Hogan. So I started following Abby and his style and his look. And then I started watching him into WCW, and then Cactus Jack came along. I started watching Cactus Jack, and then when Cactus Jack went to Japan, it was all bets are off. And then... When he did the first King of the Death match, August 20th, 1995, the famous exploding match with Terry Funk at the end, I saw an ad for it on RF, for RF Video on one of the old wrestling magazines. I ordered it, and, you know, from there, I've been hooked. I, a Pogo, Odita, Matsunaga, Jun Kasai, Bad Boy, Hito, Shadow WX, all those guys. And now, guys like Jun Kasai... Guys like um, Takeda, those guys are phenomenal, right? Ryuji Ito, Onita still going at it in Japan. It's unbelievable. And then in this side, uh, you know, in the United States, I'm a big fan of, in, in California, BC Killer and uh, JD Horror. Those guys are excellent deathmatch wrestlers. Masada, probably one of the best deathmatch wrestlers of all time. Uh, the John, John Wayne Murdoch, I actually just spoke to him on Facebook. Great guy and probably the future of deathmatch wrestling. With uh, Josh Crane, J.C. Rotten, Ron Mathis, and of course, you know, Matt Tremont. Absolutely, man. You, you mentioned Onita. Honestly, that's 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 one of my favorites because uh, he's he's the guy that got me into into deathmatch wrestling. I started watching the like you said, our videos when uh, they were they had a store in in, in the mall in Franklin Mills Mall. I, I used to live in Philly, so I used to go there all the time. Used to get the IWA stuff and used to get the FMW in the wing, and uh, I just I just fell in love with the stuff, man. Uh, you mentioned oh, Onita, that guy. He's 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 insane, man. I mean, some of the stuff that he's done, his creativity as far as FMW death matches, I don't think he gets enough credit for it because um, it, ECW kind of uh took took, took he they they took their style also with uh, alongside with Puerto Rico because Carlos Colon, hands down, he's he's one of the innovators. I mean, you can watch his stuff against Jason the Terrible, the the, the no rope barbed wire matches in the eighties. Yes. You know, the first time I ever saw a fire match was Hot Night in Bayamon, 1988, Carlos Colon versus Hercules Ayala, and it was actually on television here on uh, Channel 41, which was the big TV station for us Spanish-speaking folk in the tri-state area. So, yeah, that, you know, W's um, World Wrestling Council kind of started that, like you said, and, you know, FMW, come on, man, the, the matches with the exploding pool, the exploding ring, the landmine matches, those matches are phenomenal. And if I do have one regret in my pro wrestling career, 
is that I never got a chance to wrestle in Japan and never got a chance to do an exploding ring match. You actually just answered my next question. I was going to ask you if you have any regrets in wrestling, but you just kind of answered that. But, uh, <laughs> I think yeah, that, uh, that would be with... the number one. Nice. Well, I, that's 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 very nice, man. I I, I hear you. That's very respectable. But uh, you had you had you had a match with uh, Matt Tremont in uh, On Point Wrestling, and we're gonna have him on yeah, later. I know you guys are friends. Yeah. Oh, uh, I I got a message maybe about four years ago on Facebook, five years ago, from a young kid named Matt Tremont, and he said that he was gonna work CZW and work here and work there, and uh, that he would be honored to wrestle me down the down the road. He was doing some kind of show at that time in South Jersey. Due to some other commitments, I wasn't able to make it down. I wished him the best. Uh, he ended up uh, getting sick. I sent him a message on Facebook at that time. This is going back, like I said, about four or five years. And uh, we stayed in touch mildly from there. And uh, every time that I would see his stuff, I'd you know, send him a shout, tell him how, you know, how impressed I am as a fan of his work. And, uh, you know, as time went by, he told me he was doing his own thing. I showed up. He was wrestling Homicide at the first ever On Point Wrestling show. I went down there. Uh, I met him for the first time, and he was just the nicest, most respectful, down-to-earth human being that I have ever met. And, you know, me and him just hit it off instantly. We set up an angle for a match. Uh, he had some issues, which gladly were, were nothing, but, nothing but false issues at the time. And uh, he was able to come back, and it took us a year to build up for the match again, and we finally got it off the ground on uh, uh, May 17th, 2014. We did the match, and, I mean, it was just, you know, it was a dream come true because, sadly, it was one of my last death matches, so it'll always hold dear, near and dear in my heart, and, you know, I love Matt. Absolutely, man. Before we let you go, man, uh, one question: Your your dream match, uh, two two it could be either you or two other wrestlers in in a death match, dream match that's never happened. Um, if me personally, I I would love to see somebody like Great Sasuke and and Sabu in like a normal barbed wire, something like that. Anything anything on top of your head? Oh, if I had a chance to insert myself in a match, uh, it would probably be me. And it would probably be like a four-way with all types of gimmicks, light tubes and stuff. It would be me, Matrima, Masada, and Jun Kasai. And if it was just like a regular match, it would be me and my brother Steve Mack against Matrima and Nick Gage. Because that would be like oh. the present against the future, hard-hitting guys all around. And a match like that would have probably torn the roof off a building, but... You know, maybe it happens. Most likely it won't, but we never know. I, like I said, I, I'm i not ruling out the in-ring goodbye, mm -hmm. but a match like that might kill me, so <laughs> who knows. But uh, that would have been my dream match. And just as a fan, I think that um, we saw at the last tournament of death, we saw Kasai against Tremont. I'd like to see that as the final of the tournament of death, not as the first round match. Absolutely, man. I was actually at the tournament of death. I don't know if you've ever been at one. Actually, you you faced uh, Ian Rotten at, at at one of those tournaments, didn't you? I went. Yes, I went to uh, the one time that I worked for Combat Zone. I worked at with yeah. Ian Rotten at the Extreme Eight in Dover, Delaware. Uh, it was uh, June of two thousand and three. Uh, I was actually scheduled the next week to go to Ian's tournament, the King of the Death matches, but due to a family obligation, my mom got sick at that time. I wasn't able to go, and uh, you know that's that's you know that's the way things go. But uh, you know I gave Ian plenty of time. He actually shouts me out in his uh, King of the Death match video during the Homicide Chris Hero match in 2003, King of the Death match. Because I was honest, and I thought, hey, brother, I can't make it, you know, family first, you know. And uh, he actually reached out to me recently in, on my retirement and, you know, had nothing but kind words. And, you know, I got to say this, without Ian Rotten, Deathmatch Wrestling in the United States probably never gets as big as it did. Because after Ian left uh, ECW, 
ECW kind of waned on the blood and guts. Maybe Boss Mahoney was the only one doing it. Ian took all these guys, guys like Corporal Robinson, Necro Butcher, uh, Nate Webb, uh, Madman Pondo, and gave them a home at IWA Mid-South. And from there, all these other places started coming up with all their all their deathmatch tournaments like Carnage Cup, Master of Pain, you know, uh, Slave to the Deathmatch. UPW is going to have the Lord of the Hardcore in, Ma- in March. So all these, you know, all these companies, that idea from, you know, maybe Ian borrowed it from Japan, but I think all of them borrowed it from IWA Mid-South. And just a big shout-out to the, the undisputed king, Ian Ryan. Absolutely, man. Now, you've, you've mostly worked in the Northeast, and uh, me being from Northeast, I know, I know how the Northeast crowd is. Now, if you could compare the Northeast crowd, the, the New Jersey, Philly, New York crowd, compared to somewhere like IWA Mid-South, is there a big difference? I'll say this. The IWA Mid-South, the two times I wrestled for Ian at IWA Mid-South in Indiana, the crowds were extremely respectful uh, receptive of anybody that was new. They didn't boo you right away. They waited, and then if you showed you were a heel, they booed you. If they showed you were a face, they cheered you. If you did something great, they gave you that respect. Uh, Philly fans, I wrestled a handful of times at the old ECW arena. Philly fans are hard to please. you got to go out there and kill yourself, which I'm not uh, against doing. So, you know, I actually got their respect. And uh, yeah. you know, New York fans are home. New York fans are the fans that I that I would you know bleed and die for you know for 18 years. So I gotta thank every single fan. And you know, now that you say that, I just want to thank everybody, whether it be a nine or a 90 year old guy or anybody that ever saw me wrestle. Uh, know that I spilled that blood for your eyes, for you guys that were watching, for the fans, for the guys that love that match, for just just for anybody. I bought a ticket to watch some bloody wrestling, and I was on the show. Always remember that I gave my heart, my soul, my everything to the match that I participated in, and I never tried to cheat anybody. I always try to do my best. Absolutely, man. And honestly, man, you're you're, you're a very respectable guy. Um, you know, as far as wrestlers, there's there's a lot a lot of indie wrestlers that that regret it, but you seem like you you love the business. You don't regret anything, and I, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate every everything you've done in the business, man. We've seen some great matches out of you. I, I thank you so much for that because, like I said, that's that's the reason why I do it. It's, it's the fans. The reason why I did it, do it, whatever. It's the fans because without the fans, and I'm not talking about getting paid or whatever, which is obviously uh, the, one of the main reasons we do this, but for me always above everything else, it was the entertainment of the fans because – Without the fans, who are you wrestling for? They are the ones that bring a match up, tell you if you suck, give you that holy shit chant. They're the ones you're going out there for, and they're the reason why I go out there and, and busted my ass for 18 years. Absolutely, man. And uh, before we let you go, I know you're on your uh, on the verge of retirement, but uh, is there any upcoming shows that you'd like to plug, anything you'd like to plug before we get out of here? Yeah, I'll give a couple of quick plugs. Like I said, um, this Saturday night, um, 90 Leonardine Avenue, South River, New Jersey, UWA Elite setting the standards 2015. Uh, just a couple of great, great shows that they have lined up for this year, the starting with this one. This was actually a fundraiser for a family that lost everything in a fire. So, you know, give them a look if you're in the New Jersey area. Uh, Monster Matt, Cal the Beast, uh, Champion Robbie Roller, uh, and just just a couple, just to name a few there. Uh, March 15th, NDIW, which is ran by uh, William Biggs and Damian Slugger. They will be in Partigate Avenue in Brooklyn, New York, and that's on a Sunday afternoon, uh, March 15th. Uh, also there are uh, Slugger, Tower of Torture, Lou Nova, Justin Toxic, uh, and then, you know, two more shows, one that I'll be attending, well, three shows, one that I'll be attending, which is ICW, Queensboro Elks Lodge, Matt Tremont versus Tommy Dreamer, Samoa Joe versus Danny DeMonto, uh, Brian Myers versus the Greek God Papa Don. Those are the three reasons why I'm going to watch that show live. The next day, March 21st, JAP, Railway Rec Center, uh, Low Key versus Chris Dickinson. I don't think I need to say enough. For all the local uh, diehard wrestling fans in the area, they know what that match means. 
and then my managerial debut, which will take place at CTW Wrestling uh, on uh, April six, April seventeenth in Bridgewater, New Jersey, and uh, give them a you know CTWWrestling.com or CTW Wrestling on the Facebook. And just one quick shout out, Superstars of Wrestling, next Saturday, February twenty eighth. Nikolai Volkov, uh, Brian Myers, and just a couple of big name guys. Kentucky Brett Vincenzo, just a, a good group of guys over there at SOW. Robert Vanner runs that, and they will be in Bayville, New Jersey, on the 28th of February. That's pretty much it for plugs, and uh, you know that's it, brother. All right, man. We greatly appreciate you joining us. Uh, this this means a lot, and it was an awesome interview, man. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate being on here, and let's do this again sometime. Anytime you Most want, Most definitely, man. man. Anytime. So, All right, thank you, guys. Much love, man. No problem. We're going to get you if off. We can actually keep, one second. Yeah, if we can we'll keep you right. on for one second, actually.